everybody, and uh, thank you very much. I want to thank our next witness for being here today. Uh, we have another very important topic today, uh, which is the situation uh, of human rights in Cameroon. Uh, our witness is Felix Nkongo, who is the um, a human rights lawyer and the president of the Cameroon Anglophone Civil Society Consortium and also executive director of the Center for Human Rights and Democracy in Africa. And we are short for time, so I'll ask you to begin uh, right away with your remarks, seven or eight minutes, and then we will go to the questions. So please uh, go ahead. Thank you, honorable members. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to discuss about the human rights and humanitarian situation in the Anglophone part of Cameroon. Um, as far back as October 2016, there were peaceful protests in the Anglophone Cameroon from lawyers and teachers which degenerated into the crisis that we are facing today. As a result of the repression of the government against the lawyers and the teachers and the civil society who were clamoring for a better legal and educational system, who were clamoring to fight against the erosion of the common law, the struggle degenerated into an armed struggle as we have it today. Most of the moderate leaders were arrested, charged in a military tribunal, on grounds of terrorism, secession, incitement of civil war. And during the period, the struggle moved from the clamor for a federation, the clamor for a better living condition, to an independence movement. The government has not made things easy for the moderates and for those who believe in the unity of the state. As a result of the constant arrest and detention of pro-democracy activists, of those who are just clamoring for a better rights of the Anglophones, the burning down of villages, the destruction of livelihood, it has led to a refugee and a humanitarian catastrophe in the Anglophone part of the country. We have extrajudicial killings. Close to a thousand Anglophones are currently detained at the various prisons in the country. The process, the judicial process is very slow. The average time for a matter to come up for hearing would be up to eight months. I was a living witness. I was detained for eight months and released on the 30th with others by the President of the Republic. But during this period, the tension only increases. We believe that there is a need for an all-inclusive dialogue. The government has to speak to each and every Cameroonian, each and every Anglophone. The government has to speak to those who have taken up arms against the government because it's only through a veritable and a holistic dialogue that we can find a solution to the crisis that is affecting us. Cameroon is in a very interesting part of the continent. It's in the West and Central Africa, the SMAC and the ECOWAS, Cameroon borders both, count, both um, regions. And if Cameroon goes down, the Chad, Gabon, Congo, and Nigeria, they also go down with Cameroon. But I am here today to plead with this House to try to see how we can find a solution. The gross human rights violations, the crimes against humanity and war crimes taking place in the country need to stop. Voices have to be heard. We have a shared humanity. We owe a responsibility to protect Canadian MPs, Canadian businessmen uh, and women, Canadian diplomatic missions, owe us Cameroonians a duty to ensure that we find a solution to the crisis. Cameroon, like Canada, is a bilingual and a bicultural and a bijural country. French and English are the official languages of the country, meaning that we share something in common. Both of us are in the common world. Cameroon is in the common world with Canada. Cameroon is in um, the Francophonie, like Canada also. It means that Canada has some leverage that can play on the common world and also on the Francophonie for us to find a solution to the, the, the situation. The Canadian mission in Cameroon have made statements at times condemning or calling for dialogue. But we think that that is not enough. They need to go beyond just making statements and condemnation. We think that this committee can issue you know, a statement, a public statement, condemning the gross human rights violations taking place in the country, condemning the war crimes and crimes against humanity taking place by both parties, because also we have arms groups which are also committing atrocities in the country. But it is important also to call on government to create an enabling environment so that 
the more than 500,000 internally displaced persons could return to their villages, that the more than 50,000 refugees could return to their villages, and to also ensure that those who are currently detained should have access to their lawyers, that the process should be free and fair, that civilians should not be tried in a military tribunal. We have a jurisprudence of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights in 2009 that clearly stated that Anglophones cannot be arrested in the southwest and northwest region and tried in a military tribunal. And more often than not, they are tried in French language that most of them don't understand. The military tribunal bases itself on the 2014 anti-terrorism law. The law is not really to fight against terrorism, but it's a law that was passed to fight against dissent. It's a law that was passed to fight against those who are clamoring for change. And when the law was passed, most people did not understand that the law would be used to try Anglophones. Everybody thought it would be used to try Boko Haram officers. So the Canadians, the MPs, have to tell the government that it is inconceivable that civilians would be tried in a military tribunal. There is the need for a dialogue. There is also the need for the MPs, for Canadians, to urge the government that if we cannot find a solution, we can ask the people of Saudi Cameroons to exercise their right of a referendum, which is provided in the Constitution. Some are clamoring for a federation, and others believe in the independence of the state of Saudi Cameroons. We are in a democracy. The best option would be that they should give the people of the Saudi Cameroons the option to decide in the federation whether they want to stay in the, in the current dispensation or they want to have a separate state. But in the meantime, since that is a political process that will take long and it's very cumbersome, we need to arrest the human rights violations that is going place. We need to ensure that the humanitarian catastrophe is brought to the attention of the national and international community. Canada can raise it at the level of the Security Council, can raise it at the level of the General Assembly, can have discussions with its other partners like the US, the UK, the EU, so that we, we find a solution to this catastrophe. It is not really reported in mainstream media the way it's supposed to be done. That's a very unfortunate situation. But if you go to the southwest and the northwest regions that constitute the southern Cameroons, the situation is deplorable. Children no longer go to school. There is fear. The civilian population has been terrorized. Extrajudicial killing runs riot. There's no day in the southwest and the northwest where young men are not shot and killed for no just reason. Because they look like terrorists. Because they are dressed like members of one of the arms groups. Nobody gives them an opportunity to hear their story. We have a myriad of examples. On the 30th of July, five young men were sitting in uh, around a, a park in Boya. Boya used to be the capital of the German and the British Cameroon. Four of them were shot to death. One survived. Fortunately, or unfortunately for us, we were going somewhere and we saw him, we took him to a hospital. But the B, the military guys, came there to look for him. We had to take him out of the hospital. He's currently facing, um, he's currently having treatment. We have examples. Last month, 12 young men were shot and killed in a house. These are, doc these, ha these, these extrajudicial killings have been documented. Nobody gives any reason for them being killed. You know, it, because there's an armed struggle, because the government argues that they are supposed to be protecting the civilian, the government has taken upon itself to kill people without any reason. And there is no much that we can do in the country because everybody is scared. And with the victory of the president for the next seven years, if a solution is not found to the problem, we would be sliding into a civil war. Some have argued that there is a civil war, but each passing day, we degenerate into a civil war. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll begin immediately with questions with uh, Mr. Sweet, I believe. Yes, Mr. Sweet for six minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Nkongo. I, I'm going to give you two questions, and I'll just allow you to answer those because our time is limited. Uh, one is I'd like, I'd like you to tell us about the separatist groups. I don't want to take away from your testimony, but we'd like to hear about them, the number of them, how many are operating, and also if the National Commission for the Promotion of Bilingualism is still limping along? Is it operational? Has it gotten anywhere? Uh, yes. As, as a result of the killings, 
of unarmed civilians, the arrest, the burning down of villages, Anglophones groupings decided to come together to protect themselves. It was the term, it was a self-defense. So that is how we had the, the creation of various separatist groups and arms groups, which are now also operating in, in the country. But these separatist movements have al always existed. They existed in the 90s, the Southern Cameroon's National Council, because of the historical setup of Cameroon between the French and the English, and the fact that the, the process of reunification and the constitutional, the conference that took place in Fumban did not really go as it was supposed to be. Most Anglophones believe that there are attempts to assimilate them and to conquer and dominate them. So there's always been these protests by various groupings in Anglophone Cameroon clamoring for, for independence. The bilingual, the commission of bilingualism and multiculturalism, um, if you talk to an average, an Anglophone in particular, it's, it's of really of no object. I, I know it was created, it was created whilst we were in jail, but it was more to please the international community. It was more to show to the international community that they were doing something. The problems of the Anglophones is not about multiculturalism. It's not about bilingualism. The average Anglophone understands and speaks French. It's, it's a cultural, it's a cultural problem. It's a problem of assimilation. It's a historical problem. It's a problem of marginalization and oppression and suppression. A, a problem where the people feel, they perceive that the form of the state, the unitary decentralization, has failed. It's not addressing the problems that they face. The specificity of the Anglophones in, in Cameroon is not, cannot be addressed in the unitary de decentralization as seen in the 1996 constitution and as amended in the 2008 um, Constitution. So there is the cry for a return to either the two-state federation or at worst or at best an independent South in Cameroons. You've asked for uh, the Canadian government's help and, and rightly so. I want to ask you though, are there some governments now that are placing diplomatic pressure on the Cameroonian government that, have, that are gaining some su successful movement? There are, there, are, there are some governments that have been talking. You know, the most successful thing that Mr. Pia did was that nobody was talking about Cameroon. That, that's his biggest success in 36 years. So nobody talked about Cameroon in mainstream media. They will not discuss about Cameroon in the Canadian Parliament or in the House of Lords. But at least now they're talking about Cameroon. So governments have been putting pressure of recent, uh, the French president congratulated him for his victory, but reminded him that he should find a solution to the Anglophone problem. I know the Americans had also did. The ambassador had told Mr. Bia to think about about his legacy to try to see how we can find a solution. The UN um, advisor in charge of genocide also had brought it to the attention of Mr. Bia that he should find a solution to the crisis. Because if we don't find a solution, if the international community doesn't put pressure, we might, it might degenerate into a francophone and an anglophone uh, fight. For the time being, it's a fight between the anglophones and the institutions of the state. But if it degenerates, to a fight between the Anglophones and the Francophones, then we might get into what happened in Rwanda. And let's not forget, the never again principle would have been dealt a serious blow if Cameroon degenerates into Rwanda. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We will now move to Mr. Tabara. Uh, thank you very much for, for coming in. And again, we're very limited on time. So I just wanted to ask you, uh, uh, in terms of the situation of the press and journalists uh, prior to the election and, uh, and, and after the election and how the government has, has imprisoned for 11 to 15 year terms to uh, certain journalists and how that's degraded a lot of the democratic institutions and freedom of press. The, the government has all, always modeled the press in, in Cameroon in spite of the, the liberty laws of 1990 that ushered in a wave of press freedom, democracy, and respect of human rights. It's more, it's more cosmetic in its application. The government really doesn't respect. We, we have uh, Mancho BBC, we used to be a reporter, was given 15 years. We have about three or four Anglophone journalists who are in jail. We have others who were arrested of recent because of, 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 of protests. And because the government has a way of, of, of ensuring that you can be sued for defamation, your, your press license can be withdrawn, you know, you can be suspended. So most of the press guys, they are very, very weary. Everybody tries as much as possible not to 
um, be seen to be offensive to the government. So criticisms are very limited. The government has succeeded in creating lots of media houses that they are in control. They sanction the media houses that are very critical of them. And those media houses which preach hate speech, but which are supportive of the government, no sanction is taken against them. So uh, it's really double standard. And we, we are worried, we're scared that within the next seven years in, of Mr. Bia's presidency, the press would really, really suffer. The civic space is shrinking, not only the freedom of press, freedom of expression and assembly is shrinking. It's now difficult to have an authorization to hold a rally, to hold a meeting, to hold a press conference. We saw what recently happened with the, with the leaders of um, some of the opposition parties that their press conference was banned. So it we, we're going to have tough times with the press as we get into the next seven years of Mr. Bia's mandate. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ms. Hardcastle. Thank you very much. Can I uh, just ask you, uh, Felix, if I may, can you tell us a little bit about your own background and your uh, increased activism and, and the perspectives that you have now on, on ways that Canada can be involved. I understand you are an activist um, and you started out as a lawyer and you have in a legal community and uh, just tell us your perspectives and maybe uh, and just to take the rest of my time to maybe add a little bit of your understanding of how we led to or how things escalated to the point of the uh, Republic of Amazonia being established. Um, okay, thank you. I, I'm a lawyer. I studied in Cameroon, Nigeria, and the US. I was called to the bar in um, 1996. I have been practicing law. I worked in the UN as um, a legal advisor to the International Criminal Tribunal. I then worked as a human rights advisor with the UN mission in Afghanistan. I moved to Congo as a legal advisor to the UN police in DRC, then came back to Afghanistan as um, a legal advisor to the UN mission. But three years ago, I decided to come back to Cameroon because I felt that um, there was a need to go back home and try to see how I can contribute to the democratic process. Um, during my stay in the US in 2005, a group of Africans, students who were doing the LLM in international human rights and criminal law, we founded an organization called the Center for Human Rights and Democracy in Africa with headquarters in Cameroon, Sierra Leone, and in Kenya. I happen to be the executive the director and the founding president. So when I came back, I started running the organization whilst also having a law firm. But it wasn't enough just to be a lawyer and just to have a human rights organization. Being an activist, we decided to come together with other lawyers to create the Cameroon Anglophone Civil Society Consortium, which I was the first president. It was the consortium that reawoken um, Anglophone consciousness and nationalism and patriotism because over, over time, people had been complaining, but they needed a movement. They needed leaders who could at least be courageous enough to, to raise the issues with government. So as a result of that, we started a peaceful protest. But because we, we have a government which really doesn't respond, you know, lawyers had written about four memorandums to the state documenting the problems that they face. But unfortunately, nobody responded to them. Nobody even acknowledged receipt of, 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 of these documents. So in 2016, they decided to have a, um, a sit-in strike action. For one month, the Minister of Justice, the attorney, nobody responded to them. Then we decided that we would march in the street with our wigs and gowns to call the attention of the government. If they were really sleeping, they would realize that we mean business. But the lawyers were brutalized, they were beaten, they were dragged in the mud, their wigs and gowns were seized. As a result of that, teachers and students had to join them in protesting. But these were peaceful protests. But unfortunately, on the 17th of January, internet was disconnected in the English-speaking part of the country for three months. I, I don't know whether you can really figure out how, what it means for internet to be disconnected in part of the country for three months. And that's kind of collective punishment because it was disconnected. We've had the war in the north on Boko Haram 
which has been going on for more than a year, at no point in time, internet was cut off. But because of the protest in English-speaking Cameroon, internet was cut off for, 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 for three months. We were, we were arrested, blindfolded, and cuffed, and we, we, they, were, they drove us for, for close to 10 hours, locked up in, um, in very dehumanizing conditions, and charged in, in, in front of a military tribunal. So during this period when they had taken out the moderate leaders, the movement morphed into other uh, groupings that were, had been existing, but they really did not have the voice. So now a platform had been created. The young people in the Anglophone Cameroon who wanted change had created that platform, which we were just fortunate to be their leaders. But when we left, and because of the treatment that they had given to those who were clamoring just for federation and a better living condition in the legal and educational system, most people argue that if you were preaching for federation and you were facing the death penalty, I would rather preach secession and separation and equally face the same death penalty. So that is how positions hardened because of the way people were killed, the way people were arrested. That is how positions hardened to now we have a separatist move. But the government still had an opportunity to find a solution. It was still easy for them to at least try to address this, this, the, the problem. But at no point in time have they attempted in finding a solution to the crisis. When they released us on the 31st of August, it was a golden opportunity to release all those who were detained. But they choose to release three of myself, Justice Aya, who used to be a sitting Supreme Court justice, was arrested and detained for seven months without any trial. But they released some of us and left the others in jail. So all this have had in position in such a way that if you talk to the average person in Anglophone Cameroon, separation is now invoke. You know, now the majority of the people would not settle for anything less than separation. The majority of the people now are asking for a referendum for them to determine their fate. But we still believe that something can still be done. Notwithstanding the situation, we can at least have a dialogue. We can at least have a negotiated settlement. You know, the diaspora living in Canada also would have a role to play, you know, because they, they are very influential. They have the money. They have a voice that we can involve them also in trying to see how we can find a, a holistic solution. So the problem cannot just be solved internally without including the diaspora. I'll give you an example. Cameroon has a way of blacklisting Cameroonians by birth who are out of the country. Yes, some of them might have a dual nationality, but we have Cameroonians who have arrived at the airport with a visa and they were sent back because they encourage dissent abroad. We cannot solve the problems in Cameroon without addressing the issue of the diaspora. We need to find a way that we would grant amnesty or clemency to those who are living abroad, who have not been convicted, but who are in a blacklist by the government, meaning that there are people who have parents in Cameroon, their parents die, they cannot come to Cameroon for fear of being arrested. So okay. if this people cannot come to Cameroon as we know. They would rather prefer to come to Cameroon, which is Ambazonia. So we believe that um, the government of Canada can do a lot in trying to create enabling environment, in putting pressure on the government to call for a dialogue, and at best, ask the people of Cameroon, ask the government to organize a referendum. Yes, and, and thank you very much. Unfortunately, that is our time. I know we had a very limited time today, but thank you very much for, for you. your testimony uh, before this committee, and thank you to the members for being here today. And with that, we adjourn the committee. Thank you.